so this is one of the most famous images on the planet, Che Guevara, and almost everybody's seen his picture, but most people don't actually know very much about him. So what I'm going to do is give you guys a bit of his backstory, some of his motivation, and then some of his actions so you can judge for yourself whether he's a hero or a terrorist. Because what I've discovered is the guy's an inkblot test for your political ideology. How you feel about capitalism, how you feel about communism, are what you're seeing in his face. So, his name was actually Ernesto Guevara, but Che is a figure of speech, uh, like a buddy or pal, and he would start every sentence with it. So when he started hanging around with the Cubans, he would just start every sentence with Che, and they just started calling him that, and it stuck, it became his name, he liked it. So he was born in 1928 in Argentina. So he was in medical school, and then he finished up his exams for the term, and he and a friend decided to go on a long motorcycle trip up the continent. They got a couple of countries over before the motorcycle died, and so they took a great hitchhiking and stowaway and walking trip up the continent, went to Chile, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela. His friend left. He ended up getting on a plane that was delivering horses to Florida. They spent a month in Miami because the plane stopped working and he couldn't get back. So he got to see the cap capitalist America up very close, living as an undocumented worker, washing dishes for that month until the plane was fixed again. So what he saw on this trip started to change him because he came from a nice, comfy home, wealth and privilege. He went to good schools. They had servants. So as he was walking and hitchhiking slowly, seeing the forest people on the continent, going through all these mining towns, it started to change him. He had already been a socialist because he was raised by a socialist. But he really started to become a Marxist at this point, where he thought that if people could just have a fair break, they wouldn't be as sick as um, they were. Because as he was walking through, he was earning his living um, doing rudimentary medical work for them. He wasn't a licensed doctor yet, but they didn't need someone that was fully trained. They just needed some medical assistance. When he was in Chile, there was this poor woman who worked as a waitress until her body went out. She was having um, heart failure and asthma. And he's He's like, okay, take a diuretic, eat better, here's some asthma medicine, and there's not nothing I could do for you at all. I'm so sorry. And she had just become a burden to her family, and he just knew that it was the system destroying her because she had to work and not be able to take care of herself. Actually, there was another town he and his friend were in, once again doing rudimentary medical work in exchange for food. And there was a line of people waiting to see him at his consulting table that he put out in the middle of the town. And a little girl was watching him, and she told her mom, he's saying the exact same thing to everybody. Eat better, try to find a job that's not going to destroy your lungs and not make you sick. And he just, in his journal, he wrote, yeah, she's right. That's all I could say. So I knew in order to cure these people, I had to fixed a systemic problem that was killing them. So this is the trip that made him into a Marxist because he was seeing the graves and the human toll of these mines. Okay, so he graduated, became a full-fledged doctor, and he decided to go to Guatemala because there had just been a democratically elected socialist leader in 1951 for a socialist got elected, and he was making some really big promises. Jacobo Arbenz um, said he was going to expand voting rights, so the indigenous population were going to be treated with respect for a change. Labor was going to be allowed to organize, and the most important part is there was going to be this thing called agrarian reform. Y'all know what agrarian reform is? Nope. Okay. Well, agrarian reform is what? 
<laughs> anyway, agrarian reform is um, they were going to appropriate unused lands. So some very large agribusinesses had a lot of land there. And Guzman wasn't going to take all their land. What he was going to do was take the unused portion of their land, give them a percentage of its value. So he's going to try to pay them. And then he was going to distribute this among the unlanded farmers because these people were basically living as um, not quite slaves, but there was no other work for them other than working this land for low profits and he was going to make them into their own bosses. So taking them out of that tenantry from the medieval times into the modern era. And this unfortunately ran afoul of some really important people because the largest landowner in Guatemala was United Fruit Company. United Fruit was owned by a company in the United States that had some very powerful connections. If you look into the history of all Latin America, United Fruit is at the center of a lot of it. So the United States government put a lot of money and CIA direction into fomenting a military coup to have um, our Benz put out of office, which led to actually decades of um, disappearances, um, state massacres. So anyway. This is the actual moment that Che Guevara went from being a Marxist who was wanting to help the world through democratic means to becoming a radicalized rebel. He actually wanted to um, fight militarily, but he wasn't able to join the groups that were trying to fight on our Benz's side. This is what he said of the Americans. The last Latin American revolution, the last Latin American revolutionary democracy, that of Hacobar Benz, failed as a result of the cold, premeditated aggression carried out by the United States. Its visible head was Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, a man who, through rare coincidence, was also a stockholder and attorney for a United Fruit Company. Seeing this um, conflict of interest made him see that. In order for the world to become socialist or this Marxist utopia that he envisioned, he would have to go directly after the United States. But that was eventual an eventuality. So he fled Guatemala. It wasn't safe for him because he was a very vocal supporter of our bands. He had been with the socialists. He had been um, part of the, or trying to join the military units. So he fled to Mexico, but he had also known that Cuban exiles that were planning a revolution against their government were stationed there um, training to fight. So he met up with this young lawyer, Fidel Castro and his brother Raul and the other Cuban dissidents and they actually started training for two years. Looks like Liam Neeson. So after two years, they get ready, they go to Cuba, and they, they 82 of them get aboard this boat built for 12. The stories of that um, week-long passage are really kind of gross. It was, they weren't sailors. So the grandma, they boarded, they came ashore, but unfortunately they came aboard, they came there during the day, they'd been found out. Three days later, um, Batista's army attacked them and they went from 82 men to 20. So they fled to the mountains, okay. This is Batista. He um which one? The one in the full military game. Okay, because you basically did this. Okay. She's her brother. Yeah. So in 1940 he was elected. The li the liberals liked him, socialists liked him. He was a 
pretty good guy. He did some good reforms. After, in 1944, he left office, went to America. Not sure what changed in him, but he came back wanting to be leader. And he fomented a military coup. At the time, he had U.S. support. They liked him. So for six years, he was in charge. And he rigged the election, so he was the only one running. And he started curbing all dissent, went after them. The CIA says he politically inspired about 20,000 deaths. And that's mostly during his last couple of years in office. So he was bad. Even the people um, in Miami who hate Fidel Castro aren't sad that he's still lost or he's gone. So the 20 survivors from the grandma hid in the Sierra Maestra Mountains, which is in the very southeast right here, very mountainous region. They hid there and they knew they'd be able to plan ambushes. So they built up um, a following among the peasants. It was slow at first. It's like, follow us, we'll get you your own land. You won't have to work um, free night of fruit. You won't have to um, pick someone else's sugar cane. You can harvest it yourself. So slowly, slowly, they started building a following. But anyone who denounced them, they had to um, do summary, summary executions on because if the military found out where they were and who was helping them, everybody would be killed. So they were quick to, to dole out justice or what they saw as justice. So actually it was pretty decisive. It was only a couple of years hiding in the mountains and by January of 59, they had won. Well, when they got there, they engaged in battle. He killed his first person. He wasn't sure how he would feel about killing someone. He had never done it before. But he was like, okay, I can handle this. I'm okay with it. But while they were there in the early um, months of the revolution, um, one of their guides had left and come back. And during that time, he'd been captured, given a whole lot of money and um, to betray Castro. So he, he was ordered to be executed and the other soldiers were like, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I don't really know if he's a bad guy. And Guevara pulled out his gun and shot him in the head without hesitation. And this is from that moment. I'd like to confess, Papa, that at that moment I discovered that I really liked killing. Does it make him evil to kill a traitor? I mean, what would happen if he let the guy live? He'd go off and betray them more. And it would also send a message that, oh, it's okay um, to betray us. They'll be let go to their village. There's another story of when he had a puppy executed. He had to, he ordered its death. Completely happy, healthy puppy. But he and his men were planning an ambush on um, some of Batista's forces. And what happened is this precious little puppy was following the camp and, you know, what puppies do, they bark and it was all merry. So what happens is he ordered one of his men to make sure that dog stays back and stays away from us, like stays in another village, and the puppy followed them anyway. And the execution of the puppy couldn't be done with a gun, and why not? Guns are noisy. So he actually was there and he had to watch and record it. He was tore up in his journal by this, but unfortunately, War makes monsters of everybody. Okay. So, from there, they won the war. They were completely victorious. Batista was out of power. He survived. He was, he was exiled. Um, 
he became the chief executioner for the um, Castro government. This is an image of one of Batista's soldiers um, getting his last right before his execution, and this is the wall they used to execute. But, okay. Okay. Guevara was, could possibly be responsible for somewhere between 800 to 2,000 to 14,000 executions. Records are scarce out of Cuba. His detractors hold him very responsible for very many deaths, so it's hard to tell. But even at the highest point of that, the 14,000 executions, during the Reign of Terror, during the nine-month period, there were 300,000 political arrests and 17,000 executions for political reasons. Probably more like 40,000. But once again, records are scarce from revolution. And remember how I said the um, Cuban Revolution was fast? I just want to contrast that to the Mexican Revolution that happens, what, 40 years before, give or take? Um, that one lasted 10 years, a million and a half people died, and they went through 12 regime changes in, during that 12 year or 10 year time. Imagine trying to live and do business under that kind of chaos. So, as brutal as the crackdowns were at the end of the Batista regi regime and into the Castro regime, it was a lot less chaotic than that. Okay, and there's a, a lot of detractors, and I'm not sure how much truth is this, how much hyperbole, he executed a woman who was six months pregnant. He killed a 12-year-old because he was um, trying to fight his father's execution. Okay. Yeah. But he was saying, I was trying to destroy the army, as the enemy army, not as men, but as the whole um, class of them. So he didn't execute anyone except for war criminals who were shot before a firing squad. This too was done openly before the public opinion of the continent and with a clear conscience. He was saying he wasn't arbitrarily killing. Of course, in this chaos, there was a lot of arbitrary killing. Um, his detractors are saying, yes, he's only responsible for this many deaths on paper, but the goons of the new regime were taking people to prison, beating them up, and then reporting their deaths as heart failure. So we really don't know how much truth there is in this. Okay, so as I said, where's the truth? This book is the one that holds him responsible for 14,000 deaths. They also hold communism in general responsible for 100,000, or no, sorry, 100 million deaths. Yeah. So they're on the very, very high end. Um, of course, his diaries explain all this. Um, his friends explain all this. Like, so they explain away all the atrocities. It had to be done for the good of the country, for the good of the revolution. Okay. So this is a quote by him. If the nuclear missiles had remained in Cuba, we would have fired them against the heart of the U.S., including New York. The victory of socialism is well worth the millions of atomic victims. That sounds like a terrorist, right? Just there's a problem. This is on a blog against communism. What he actually said is, if the Americans attack, we shall fight to the end. If the rockets had been remained in Cuba, we would use them all and directed them against the very heart of the United States, including New York, in our defense against aggression. But we haven't got them, so we'll fight with what we got. Of course, how do you feel about him nuking how many Americans? Is it still a terrorist act? The Americans would have just gone in with troops. 
Is it terrorism? Okay. Here's another quote by him. Um, imperialism considered us weak and submissive, us being Latin America, but the Yankee monopoly capitalism now sees its grave diggers. He's trying to get a Pan-America uprising to overthrow the um, American hegemony. So, but that wasn't quite enough for him. He, he was successful in Cuba. He wanted this revolution to be worldwide. Um, he spoke before the United Nations denouncing the United States. He was actually at this time actually becoming critical of the Soviet Union too, saying they were a little bit too capitalistic. Um, and so he went on a tour of Africa, starting in Algeria, Mali, Congo, Guinea, Ghana, the Hami, which is gone by the way, um, Egypt, and then Tanzania. So what he was doing was helping recruit for this organization of solidarity, of friendship between the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Rise up for all the oppressed peoples of the world to stand up to their oppressors. I think he envisioned both against the Soviets and the United States. Let us develop a true proletarian internationalism. And the first conference of these oppressed peoples was held in Havana in 1966. So their first goal was to support Vietnam. Um, the, the largest of the imperialist powers feels in its guts the bleeding inflicted by a poor, underdeveloped country. Its fabulous economy feels the strain of the war effort. The strategic end of the struggle should be the destruction of imperialism this is one of his most famous lines, and it's very misphrased or taken out of context, but how close we could look into a bright future should two, three, or many Vietnams flourish throughout the world with their share of deaths and their immense tragedies. What he was saying is, yeah, the full weight of America is coming down on this poor country. What happens if we just stir up enough agitation in Africa and in Latin America. Have them have all these Vietnams are fighting. They'll get tired of us all. It'll destroy them. Okay. They wanted to launch constant and firm attacks on all fronts where the confrontation is taking place. So this is a symbol of Vietnam and solidarity creating a net against this U.S. aggression. I think that's a pretty powerful image. Okay, so Bolivia, 1957. At first he was thinking this was going to be the start, or like the base to start a whole bunch of different rebellions in Latin America. But when he got there, he decided, no, we're going to take Bolivia first and make that into that domino effect that they're so afraid of. We'll make this the test case. But that full might of the U.S. that he was worried about, the CIA sent in a lot of um, troops. Um, he actually wanted to lead this rebellion, and the Bolivian communists that were aligned with the Soviet Union thought it should be in their hands. So he was actually alone with the soldiers he brought from Cuba. And he was captured and executed. So, question is then, now that you know about him, is he a hero or is he a terrorist? Nineteen fifty seven to the 